Missed it. Good morning, church. Go ahead and take a seat. <laughs> oh, she's all good. She's all good, Rob. Good morning. Good morning. I see a gentleman in the back corner over here, more happy than usual, and I'm guessing it's because we got a dub yesterday. Is that right? Uh, by the way, dub means W. The Huskers won, just in case you were hiding under a rock. We had someone yell, go Pokes. If you don't know what that means, that's the majority of America. That would be the Oklahoma State Cowboys, which no one cares about as a football program. Speaking of tough times and uh, Nebraska football, today's message is going to be really simple, church. Don't give up. Don't give up. I'm speaking to the choir when I say that life is full of ups and downs. Some of us are living on the downside of the curve of life. Don't give up. And some of us inevitably will end up on a down, sir, downside of life, don't give up. It's really easy to say those words, for me to say that from stage, and for us to nod our heads in agreement. But the reality is, is that it's really difficult. The good news is that God's word has given us a tool when we are on the downside of things to not give up a tool that will open up our eyes to look heavenward and be filled with God's spirit and full of his glory, amen? amen. Some of you gave amen. Those, you, I can tell you already had a quiet time this morning. You were straight throughout the week with you and the spirit of Christ because I haven't even told you about that tool and you're ready and you're already about it. Let's get into what that tool actually is. Hebrews 12, verse one. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes, not on circumstances, church, but on Jesus, who is he, church, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Hallelujah. For the joy set before him, church, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And look at this promise, church. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that we would not grow weary and give up. There is power in considering the perseverance of Christ. There is power in his name when we consider the grit of God himself. There is power when we step out of our circumstances within our thought life and instead we look at the life of Christ whose blood is flowing through our veins, church, and we see how he persevered through all of the sufferings on his way to the cross. And here's what I love about Hebrews is that the Hebrew writer tells us as a promise from God that we, if we do this, church, will not grow weary nor give up. For those of us who are not inspired now, God will inspire us in the future to relook at this message, to relook at Hebrews chapter 12, to look at those verses, to inspire our hearts. This morning, we're going to go through the opposition that Jesus encountered on his way to the cross. You see, we're in Luke at the end of chapter 22. We're going to go all the way through chapter 23, and we're going to look through the last 13 hours of Jesus's life. It's going to cover and detail his mock trial, his flogging, and his crucifixion. All of that in today, and that message, is going to take precedent from 2 a.m. to 3 p.m. before his last dying breath. See, prior to this scene, Jesus wrestled with God in the Garden of Gethsemane. We covered that a couple weeks earlier. Why, church, if you remember, did he wrestle with God the Father? He did not desire nor want to go through this suffering that we're going to cover. And yet still, he endured that suffering in pursuit of you in pursuit of your family, 
so that we would read of all the promises in God's word and that by faith, if we've given our life to Jesus, it would be applied to us and our households in Jesus' name. So that's gonna be today's focus. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for all these little babies and little kids talking. It reminds me of the life that is young within your church. God, I pray that there would come uh, relief for all the parents whose kids are running around talking, God. We are grateful for your presence, Holy Spirit. We desire you to be in our midst right now and to increase ever more so. God, you love us so much. Don't allow us to walk away from this sanctuary unchanged, whether it be in some small degree or in a great one. God, you know us personally. I cannot tailor make a message for every soul in this congregation, but you can, God. Your spirit can. And it's not by my might, nor by my strength, God, but by your spirit that we would learn exactly what you desire us to learn. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, quick context before we get into this. What just happened before we get into our reading is that Jesus has been betrayed by one of his closest of disciples, his followers, and that's in the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas. And here's where we enter in chapter 22, verse 63. The guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and said, prophesy to us. Who hit you that time? And they hurled all sorts of terrible insults. Some of us never get over insults. Some of us lose sleep over insults. Some of us have gotten distance created between us and our loved ones or friends over the years because of insults. Why is that, church? The power of life and death comes from the tongue. And in this scene, we see that the people that Jesus came to save are hurling and heaping upon the Messiah of the world death and shame, as we see in this scene. And I bring it up because for the next seven hours, this is what Jesus is going to be hearing. As we hear right now of these babies, these kids in our midst, what he was hearing 2,000 years ago was nothing but insults and mockery. For seven hours in excruciating pain. Let's read on. Verse 66. We're going to read through a big block of text here. At daybreak near 5 a.m., all the elders of the people assembled, including the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before his high council, and they said, Tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. They all shouted, so you're claiming to be the Son of God. And he replied, you say that I am. Why do we need other witnesses, they said. We ourselves have heard him say it. The council of the Jewish leaders at the time found him guilty of blasphemy. To their Jewish ears, they understood the Old Testament. And when Jesus is saying that he is the son of man, that's a reference to Ezekiel. When he says that he's the son of God, they recognize he's equating his characteristics and personality to God. And so they are going to try to kill him. Leviticus 24 verse 16 is the text that they would go to and say, he is blaspheming God, we've all heard him, let's get Jesus killed. The issue is that they could not execute capital punishment. They couldn't kill someone. During that time, two years prior, the Roman Empire took away that ability from the Jews in order to quelch any misunderstanding, any unjust uh, capital punishment. And so two years prior to this, they took it away. So it's because of that these Jewish council leaders will now have to go to the local Roman governor of their area, whose name is Pilate. And this is what we're gonna read about right now. Verse, or chapter 23, verse one. 
the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman governor and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Notice, the Jewish leaders go to Pilate and they accuse Jesus of leading an insurrection. In other words, leading a coup of rebels, of Jewish rebels against the Roman government. That is different than the accusation that they found him guilty of prior to this scene. In other words, church, they were lying on him. They knew that it wasn't a capital offense in Roman law if they were to take to the Romans, hey, this guy claims to be the Messiah. Instead, they make up that he is trying to lead a revolt against Caesar, the king, the emperor of Rome. So they make up these charges. They make up these accusations just to get Jesus killed. We aren't but within a couple hours into Jesus' suffering. In church, we see that not only are they mocking him, not only are they beginning to throw shame on him, but they're also beginning to lie on the Messiah. Church, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that we would not grow weary and give up. Endure, church. Let's continue to read on. Praise God, by the way, that we have a God who's endured being lied upon and rejected, who can empathize with our weaknesses. Verse three, so Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you've said it. Pilate turned to the leading priests and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Judgment has came. It is righteous. Pilate has said nothing wrong with Jesus. Then they, the Jews in whom Jesus came to save, they respond in this way. He's causing riots by teaching wherever he goes, all over Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Oh, is he a Galilean? Pilate asked. When they said that he was, Pilate sent him to Herod Antipas because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction and Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at Passover. Pilate is passive. History tells us that he was passive because he was in a lot of heat from the emperor at the time because he was, having, uh, he was too trigger happy in executing people. And so we see him passive in his judgment, and then we see him defer leadership, and he gives it to the Jew Jewish ruler at the time, whose name was Herod Antipas. When you hear Herod in the New Testament, most of the time it's talking about this Herod. Herod is just a family name of a group of people who were designated by the Roman Empire during Jesus' time. And they were meant to be essentially the kings and the rulers of that time. Not assigned by God, but assigned by the Roman emperor. And the Herod at this time is Antipas. He's the son of the Herod who tried to kill baby Jesus 30 years prior to this text. Let's continue and see what Herod has to say. Here our Messiah gets passed on. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. He asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Then Herod and his soldiers began, here it is again, church, mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. Jesus is exhausted, sleep deprived, and beaten. And right now he's standing before Herod, who's ridiculing him. Herod asks him if he is the Messiah. Jesus will not respond. And so he makes a mockery of him. And he does so by asking Jesus to perform a miracle like he's a parlor trick. Like he's a clown. Asking Jesus to show up and just perform in front of his people, church. Consider him 
who endured such opposition from sinful men that we would not grow weary nor give up. Let's continue to read. What we're going to see next is Jesus' rejection. Verse 13. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced his verdict. He brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him, here it is the second time, innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the the death penalty, so I will have him flogged and then I will release him. Pilate makes another righteous judgment. But we all know in this room, if you've read your text, read the Bible, that he doesn't stick with it. Look with me. Then a mighty roar from the crowd in which Jesus came to save, and with one voice they shouted, Kill him! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas was a prison for taking part in an insurrection, so he's actually the guilty person of trying to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Pilate argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus. That was Pilate's desire. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he demanded why. What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death. So I, again he repeats this, will have him flogged and then I will release him. But... The mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded, as they had requested. He released Barabbas, the man in prison for insurrection and murder, but he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wish. If you've ever been rejected, you're in good company, church. Your Messiah was rejected. And it's not just three, time from the, three times from these people who Jesus came to save. We heard last week from even his closest of friends. And to top it off, he hears the people ask to release a murderer in exchange for his life. Side note, just a historical note, the exchanging happened once every seven years during the uh, feast of Passover, and it was implemented so that Rome would curry favor with the Jews. And here we see it actually happening. Ironically, church, Barabbas translates into the son of the father. Bara means the son of, it's a prefix title. And Abba, if you're familiar with Jewish context or language, means father. The Fa- the son of the father. And the irony is that he exchanges the son of the father for the true son of the father. The irony is that Barabbas was a murderer when Jesus was the one who created life and preserves it. The irony is that Barabbas rebelled against authority, but Jesus is the ultimate authority and designer of our souls, and he placed order over us in order for humans to flourish. Church, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that we will not grow weary nor give up. We're going to read on because things get a lot worse. Twice you heard me read about Pilate acquiescing to the crowd and saying, listen, bare minimum, I'll have him flogged. Okay, that's really easy for us to read and pass over just as a Bible reader. But the actual whip that was used to torture the condemned was something that nearly beat a person to death before they were even crucified. You'll see here an image of what most likely it looked like during Jesus' day. Typically, the victim would be naked, tied by his wrists, and his back exposed. They would whip the condemned person from the back of the head all, all the way down to the lower back, to the buttocks, down to the calves. And the whip was made of glass, bone, and metal. Each knob would approximately leave a gash 
of two inches in length and one inch deep. In other words, for each gash it left was about 20 stitches to close up in modern day. And flogging, they would start at the wrist where they... The, the torture wasn't efficient because of the brutality and the force from the Roman soldier down on the whip onto the condemned body. What was the torturing thing was the flick of their wrist. In other words, the more they would flick their wrist back, the more that chunks of flesh would be ripped off of the condemned body. And the historical documents show us that on average during that time, that the condemned would be whipped approximately 39 times. That would mean approximately in modern day, 7,000 stitches to heal up and to bind the wounds that were exposed after Jesus' flogging. And it's easy for us to talk about from these Great auditorium seats, cushioned, great lighting in the room. It's another thing to see and be reminded. So right now you're going to see the screen come down, and we are going to watch the Passion of the Christ, a few minutes of what that flogging looked like. Warning, if you do not want your children to see this, feel free to exit at this time, because it's going to be a brutal beating that we're gonna end up seeing in which our Savior endured. I understand the risk that was taken by showing that. Oh my gosh, amen. I understand that there's probably gonna be um, some conversations that some of us will have to wanna to have with our kids. <clears throat> I sense the Spirit's leading because some of us need to be woken up and so the realities of what it really cost us to have the spirit of Christ within us. Isaiah 53, have this in mind. Verse three reads, he was despised and rejected a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried it was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, hallelujah. He was whipped so that we could be healed, hallelujah. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of our people. Church, when we're on the lows of life, even in the mundanes, would we consider him who endured such opposition from men so that we would not grow weary and give up on God, on our families, on his people, on his spirits leading as so much as we discern? There is so much more for us, church that God wants to use us in and grow us through in these last days. We are a church that will always, by God's grace, center our understanding of existence on Jesus and his rescue mission. And we are grateful for his spirit that's been deposited to us to walk us through every season of life. Consider him, church. And for the person who has never or does not follow Jesus, I did not for 18 years of my life. I was comfortable living an independent life apart from my creator and I didn't even know it. 
until one day I said yes to Jesus when I was in depression in college. And by God's grace, he gave me his spirit and I experienced life that I didn't even know I was missing for the first time ever. And this right here was my main motivation in obeying Jesus for the first three years of being a son of his. You do not know what you are missing out on. This sacrifice that we just watched, which is a portrayal of what most likely happened, but was a diet version most likely of Jesus being beaten beyond recognition, that is applied. Every blessing of it is applied to the person who have put their trust in Jesus, their creator. And I want to give you an opportunity right now as the worship team comes up. If you sense that that is where God is leading you, following him is simple. There may be a lot of questions, but it's simply with a heart posture that someone would have that says, God, I'm done running my life in what I think would is the right way to do it, which ultimately lacks leaning on you as my creator. And God, I desire a relationship with you. I am willing to turn from the way that I valued life, and I'm willing to learn your teachings, follow you, and be restored back into a relationship with God the Father. My friend, this right here is a beautiful thing when you give your life to Jesus. So let's pray right now. Jesus, I am grateful and thankful, God, for this message that you've given us today near the end of the Gospel of Luke. God, I pray that you would continue to move our hearts into greater obedience wherever you would lead. And as uh, all the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to give that person who's in the room an opportunity to follow Jesus for the first time. I just, with everyone's eyes closed and head bowed down, just listen to this prayer that exemplifies a heart that is ready to give their life to Jesus. God, I don't have it figured out. I desire to follow you. I want you, God. I need you and I give you ownership of my life. Jesus, I desire you to save me from myself and the repercussions of what it looks like to live apart from you. So if that's you and your heart, I just wanna pray that prayer as everyone's eyes are closed and head bowed down right now. And I just want you to repeat that if it resonates with where you are right now. Jesus, you can do it even in your thoughts. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I desire to follow you. I don't have everything figured out. Would you please forgive me for my selfishness? And would you please give me your spirit right now? I choose to turn from my way of life and choose to turn to you. Now with everyone's head bowed, I just wanna let you know that if you prayed that prayer genuinely, God knows your heart. And a transaction has happened to where you have become his son or his daughter for the very first time. And that's all by faith, nothing you've done truly by faith. If that is you, I just want to welcome you into the kingdom if you're in here. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand if that was you who prayed that prayer for the very first time. While all eyes are closed and head bowed, I just want to welcome you to God's kingdom. God, we thank you for your presence this morning, and we thank you for being Lord and Master of all. 
Would you fuel our worship in greater gratitude through the words of your scriptures this morning? In Jesus' name, amen.